All right, you may be seated. Um, last week we started on foundations, basing it out of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. <clears throat> last, last week we got through the first two. We got through repentance from dead works, and we got through the um, faith towards God. So tonight we're going to start looking at doctrine of baptisms. And as it says, doctrine of baptisms is not just one. And Pastor Caleb talked on this the other week when he talked about what do we as set free believe, and he talked about the different types of baptisms. Well, I'm going to go into them, not contradicting him, but going to go in a little different direction and, and try to bring some things out from a different point. So in the doctrine of baptisms, Luke 3.3 3 is, is, is known as the baptism of repentance. It's also the baptism for the remission of sins. It's also talked about as John's baptism or water baptism. And we typically when we think about baptism, we think of water baptism. And the word baptism comes from the Greek word baptismos. It means a washing, purification, affected by means of water. So obviously we think of baptism, we think about immersion in, in water. And um, so when we look at the baptism of repentance in Luke 3, 3, it says, And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And in Mark 1, 4 through 5, it says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judah and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So when we look at that, if you get your Strong's Concordance out and you start studying baptism, baptism is strictly a New Testament thing. So where did the Holy Spirit take me to study baptism? The Old Testament. You cannot find the word baptism in the Old Testament. It's not mentioned in the Old Testament. So when the Holy Spirit took me to the Old Testament, I was like, okay, how, do we, how are we tying these together? But the Bible says that God gave us the Old Testament as an example of the new. So the two things he took me to in the Old Testament kind of really brought out some things for me about baptism, about water baptism. And the first one he took me to is a very common story. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, through Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. And we all know the story of Noah's Ark. And you say, okay, tie this together on how is Noah's Ark related to baptism? Well, if you look at what we look at as baptism, we go to the water, we're, we're laid into the water, and we're raised again. And so we go in as an old creation. We we're, we're basically represent we're dying to our old self. When we come up, we're a new creation. And the Holy Spirit showed me that with Noah and the ark, what happened was Noah went into the ark, and he went into the waters. Now, he was in the boat, obviously, but he went into the waters. And when he went into the waters, the floods flooded the earth, and everything was washed away. So when he went into the waters, he couldn't look back. His old life, his old self, everything about his past it was in the past. He couldn't turn around and go backwards in the boat and get back to where he was. The, the going into the waters meant that everything of his past had been washed away. When he came out on the other side and the boat touched ground and he opened the door of the boat, everything was new. He was essentially a new creation. The earth was a new creation. Everything was new. There was nothing he could go back to. His friends were gone. They died in the flood. His house was gone. It was washed away in the flood. The plants were gone. His city, his village, everything he knew was gone. It was washed away in the flood. So the only thing he could do, because he couldn't go backwards, if he looked this way, everything was new. All new ground, all new plants, all new everything. If he looked this way, everything was new. If he looked this way, everything was new. Everything was new in his life. So he couldn't go backwards. He had to look up and say, God, you got me. He'd go forward. That's the only thing he could do. So when we look at water baptism, that's the way we need to look at it. I've gone into the water. My past, everything about my past, everything that's holding me back, everything that I've been involved in 
is gone. It's dying in the water. I'm coming out of the water as a new creation. I'm moving forward. The only thing I can do when I come out of the water is look up to God and move forward. Look up to God, move forward. Doesn't matter whether I look to the right, to the left, or straight forward. I don't want to look backwards. So that was the first thing he showed me from the Old Testament. I was like, that makes it pretty clear. Because I've always thought baptism was just representing the death and resurrection. And we come out as a new creation. And that makes it very clear. The second thing he gave me, Exodus 13, 17, through Exodus 14, 31. And again, this is a very familiar story. This is Moses with the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of the land of bondage, and they come up to the border of the Red Sea. And here's, here's a point where they've got to make a choice. They could turn around and go back, and go back into the bondage. They could go back into Egypt. They could go back into everything that they knew. Where, Mo, where Noah was different, he couldn't go back. Once, they, once the flood started, he couldn't go back. He had no choice. The children of Israel, they had a choice. They could turn around and go back. And they were questioning. They, I mean, they were, they were upset with Moses because they were like, here you've brought us to the border of the sea, and we're surrounded by water, and we're surrounded by our enemy. You brought us here to die, didn't you? Well, that's what it represents. It's a place of death. Baptism represents a place of death. We've got to die to our old self. So when we go into the water... Notice they stepped into the water. Moses stepped into the water. The water parted. The, dra the ground dried up, and they began to walk across on dry ground. When they came out on the other side, guess what happened? Everything that held them in bondage died in the water. The children of Israel came into the water, and they were going to pursue them across the water. But when they stepped out on the other side, the waters closed in, and every bondage that they had died in the water. Every, everything, the drug addictions they had, died in the water. The, the lust they had, died in the water. And guess what? When they got to the other side, it was the same thing. They couldn't go back. They came out of the water. They could not go back. Because in order for them to go back, God wasn't going to part the water for them to, to back up. They had to go forward. They had to give up their old self. They had to give up their old life. I mean, think about it. Their houses were in Egypt. Their friends were with them going through the water. The places that they lived, the things they did, everything about them had to change. They came through that water, and now everything of their past was dead. The only thing they could do was move forward. They're like, God, we're on the other side of the water now. We're in a new place. We're in a new, new season. We're in a new time. We don't have houses. We don't have land. We don't have all this. But... We're moving forward. They had to completely trust God to move them forward. In, in the land of Egypt, they were trusting the Egyptians to make sure that oh, the Egyptians put taskmasters on them to make sure that they, they did the work, and the Egyptians made sure that they were fed and provided minimal things. But when they came out, they everything, every bondage, everything died in the water. And for me, those two examples from the Old Testament really clarified water baptism. I mean, I'd seen it before, but not to this extent. I mean, this brought water baptism reality. When we get water baptized, we go into the water, everything of our addictions, our bondages, everything, it dies in the water. And we come out the other side, we are a new creation. We've got nothing... Behind, nothing behind us that we can go back to. I mean, you can't reverse going into the water and coming out dry. When you come out, you're wet. So when we go into water, we come out, we've been washed. We're coming out on the other side. We're a new creation. So water, water baptism represents the old person going into the water, leaving behind the old lifestyle, coming up out of the waters, new, clean, and a changed person. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So when they came through the water in the Old Testament, when Noah came out of the boat, everything was new. The creation was new. 
I mean, the plants, the animals, the only animals that were there were the ones on the boat. They all came out through it. They were all, everything was new. It says, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And Noah's Ark is a perfect example of that because when the floods came, everything died except for what was on the boat. The plants died, the trees died, the grass died, the animals died, the people died. When he came out of the boat, everything was new. And we have to look at water baptism from that perspective. And 1 Corinthians 10, 11, it tells us, Now all these things happened to them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So when we look at water baptism, like I say, baptism is entirely New Testament. But the Old Testament gives us an example and makes it clear. So next one. We're going to move kind of quick tonight because I've got to try to finish up tonight. Baptism into the body of Christ. And I know I'm not necessarily going in order of some people, but we're looking at the baptism into the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. So when we become a Christian, when we're born again, we're born into the body of Christ. So that means that we're all put into the body of Christ and we form a, the, the position that we're put in, we form a place in the body and we're supposed to function in that place in the body. So in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, it says, For as the body is one, notice, there's only one body of Christ. This nonsense of denomination, denomination means division. It doesn't matter if your brother is a Baptist or a Methodist or, or what denomination they are. If they have been born again, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. There shouldn't be this competition, oh, well, you need to come to my church. No, you need to come to Jesus. It's not about this church or that church or whatever church. It's not about trying to build a denomination. It's about building the body of Christ. We're all one body. We need to function as unified body of Christ and work together to win souls and bring people to Christ because the world's looking at the body of Christ going, they're so divided, they can't do anything. They're looking at it saying, well, this group's fighting against that group, and it shouldn't be that way. We're one body. And on down in that verse of Scripture, it says, and hath many members. Now, if, if you have any idea of the medical profession, you know this a whole lot more than me. But our physical body is made up of so many individual parts. I mean, I couldn't begin to tell you how many skin cells there are. I couldn't begin to tell you how many muscle fibers there are, how many muscles there are, how many ligaments there are, tendons, all those things. I couldn't begin to tell you that. And the body of Christ is the same way. We're made up of Blacks, whites, Hispanics, Asians, all these different nationalities, all these different groups, all these different people from all over the world, not just Americans, but people from Europe, people from Asia, people from Australia, people from all over the world make up the body of Christ. And as a result of that, we need to understand, hey, it's not just us that are going to be in heaven. We need to understand we're going to be in heaven with a, a mixture of people. It's going to be just a, a plethora of different people, different races, different nationalities, different everything. And we're the body of Christ. It says, and it goes down in that same verse, it says, And all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. And in verse 18, same chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18, it says, But now hath God, set the members in the body, every one of them as it has pleased him. Now I want you to understand something. When we become a, born again and we enter into the body of Christ, our mamas don't set us in that body, our daddies don't set us in that body, our pastor doesn't set us in that body. God sets us in the body and where it pleases him. Now see, I don't know your personalities. I don't know your characteristics. I don't know the things about you that make you beneficial to the body. But God does. So when he puts you in the body, he looks at you completely. And he puts you in a place where you function 
properly. And see, we shouldn't get upset if God tells me that I'm the toenail on the little toe. If I'm the toenail on the little toe, bless God, I'm part of the body. I shouldn't get offended by somebody that's a fingernail or a head or a hair or whatever. I am a part of the body. And if I'm supposed to be that little bitty toenail, I'm going to rejoice because I'm part of the body. I'm not going to get jealous. I'm not going to get angry because somebody is a hair. I'm not going to get jealous. I'm not going to get angry because somebody's a wrist or somebody's a knee or an ankle. See, if, if God put me as a toenail and I tried to function as a wrist, there's going to be major problems. And a lot of times we get frustrated because of several, to, several different reasons. One of the reasons people get frustrated is they're not submitting to God, so God's not able to use them where he's put them. They're resisting God, and they're trying to function in the things that God's called them to, but they're, not res they're resisting God, not submitting to him, so God can't use them in that position, and they're getting frustrated. The second reason many people get frustrated is because they're looking at another person's position and wishing they were in that position. I can't function in a position that God didn't call me to. I don't preach like Pastor Caleb. I'm not, I don't, I'd run people off preaching like that. I mean, Pastor Caleb is called to that position, called with that anointing, called with that gifting. And if I tried to preach like that, I'd either have a lot of people laughing or a lot of people leaving. <laughs> I have to do the things that God's called me to do. I have to function in the body where God put me in the way that God has created me because he knows my gifts, he knows my abilities, he knows the things that make me beneficial to the body. Verse 24 through 26 says, But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. I want to say this because many times we look at those of us that are in positions up here and we want to put all the honor on them. But many times it's the people behind the scene that need the honor. God's given them the honor, not the ones. I mean, yes, we honor our pastors. We honor our leaders. But God many times puts those in the background, gives them the abundant honor. God raises them and elevates them. That there should be no schism in the body. In other words, that there should be no division in the body. God put us in that body. He wants us to function in that place so that we can work together like a well-oiled machine. It shouldn't be that I'm over here bumping elbows with you, trying to fight with you to get your position. No. I've got a lane. My lane's right here. I'm going to stay in my lane. If I was running track and I'm on a certain thing, I've got to stay in my lane because if I cross the lane, I get disqualified. So I've got to stay in my lane. My neighbor's lane's over here. They've got to stay in their lane. My other neighbor's lane's over here. They've got to stay in their lane. When we function together, we can move easily the way we should. We should all function together so that we can accomplish the things that God's called the body to do. But that the members should have the same care one for another. So when I'm walking along in my lane, I should be concerned about my brother beside me, my sister beside me, saying, hey, you're falling behind. You're starting to get slack on God. Come on. Keep up. Hey, you're not spending time in prayer. Come on. Let's get up here. Let's pray together. You're not spending time in the Word. Come on. Let's read the Word together. Come on. Get up here with me. We, should, we shouldn't be looking at our brothers and sisters saying, oh, they're falling behind. Look, I'm moving on. No, we should be grabbing our brothers and sisters saying, come on. Come on. Stay up here with me. You're struggling right now. Let me, let me help you get up here. Whether one member suffer, all the members suffer. When one member suffers, when one member of the body of Christ suffers, it affects every one of us. We're every one members of the body of Christ. And no, I may not know exactly what's going on in your life, but when you suffer, it affects me. When I suffer, it affects you. And we've got to learn to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So when one member is suffering, the Holy Spirit can guide us to pray for that person, to call that person, to reach out to that person and say, hey, just like I said, grab that person and pull them up with us. Come on. You're struggling. Come on. 
you're suffering, you're going through something, let me bring you up here with me. And all the members suffer, suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Same thing, if one member gets honored, we're all getting honored. We should all rejoice when one, per, when one member rejoices. When one person gets honored, we should all rejoice. We should all go through that. So God puts us in the body in such a manner that we all work together as a well old, fully cohesive unit, not numerous individual parts. If you've ever watched a ball game and you see somebody out there trying to win the game by themselves, it's not going to happen. I don't care how talented, how good of an athlete that person is, that one person will never beat a team. I don't care who it is. You put on an evenly matched team, one person will never defeat a team. When all the parts are functioning properly, the body of Christ has no division, no confusion, and no separation. It functions fluidly to accomplish the will of God on earth. The suffering of one does not single out that one individual, but rather when the body is functioning as one, it affects every member of the body. When one person hurts, the body grieves with them. When one rejoices, the body should rejoice. So we're going to move on. That's basically the baptism in the body. Next, we're going to look at the baptism in the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 1, verse 5, it says, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. I want you to recognize that there's a total separate baptism than water baptism. There's a baptism in the Holy Ghost. And I've heard many people say the, all the Pentecostal church believes in different levels of the Holy Spirit. No, we don't. We believe in different levels of relationship with the Holy Spirit. If you go back and look at one of my messages, a while back I taught that there's three different levels of relationship. There's the physical relationship, there's the emotional relationship, and there's the spiritual relationship. We should all learn to function in the different levels of relationship. Most of us know each other on a physical relationship. If we see each other out in public, hey, how you doing? We're not on an emotional relationship. We don't spend time together to get to know each other that way. We don't have a, a deep, deeper relationship. We've got to get to the emotional relationship before I... You want to know who I am really deep? You're going to have to get with me. You're going to have to spend some time with me. I'm not going to reveal the innermost parts of me until we know each other, until I can fully trust you with my heart. So if we want relationship with the Holy Spirit... We, and with Christ, we've got to get a relationship where the Holy Spirit can fully trust us. He's, he's going to reveal Christ to us when he fully trusts us. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in Acts 1.8, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea, and in Samaria, and to, under, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, when we look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in order to understand what it is, one of the best things we need to do is understand who the Holy Spirit is. Without understanding who the Holy Spirit is and how he functions in our life, we don't really understand what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does. I mean, if I, if I walk up to you and say, hey, boom, there's you got the Holy Spirit. Or if I walk up to you and give you a set of keys to a car and I don't explain anything to you about that car, and you've never been in a car like that before. You don't know how the air works. You don't know how to adjust the mirrors. You don't even know where the starter, the key goes in the ignition. If it even has a key to go in. It might be a push button. If you don't know anything about it, you can't function in that car. So you start going down the road in that car and all of a sudden you're like, uh-oh, I need to change lanes. You don't, I mean, yeah, you can turn the steering wheel, but you don't know how to function in that car because you don't understand that car. Same thing with the Holy Spirit. If we don't understand who the Holy Spirit is and how he functions through us, we don't understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the first thing we see, it says, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. In John 14, 16, it says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Now here's Jesus speaking. And two of the words he used there, another comforter. Those are Greek words, alos parakletos. Alos means another exactly like him. So in other words, if I were to give you a baseball, I'd like to refer to baseball because I played baseball. If I were to give you a baseball and say, hey, would you like another one? And you say, yeah, give me another one. And so I walk up to you and give you a tennis ball. 
Well, they're the same size. They're similar. But they're not exactly the same. But you say, yeah, I, I thought you were going to give me another one just like it. Oh, I thought you just wanted another ball. Well, here, let me get you another baseball. And you look on that baseball, and there's writing on that ball that might say official baseball of the Major League Baseball. Or it might say official baseball of the South Carolina High School League. Or official baseball of the Little League. Each baseball is designed differently for the different levels of sport. So when you look at that ball, you might look at it and say, oh, thank you, you gave me another baseball. But then you get to looking on it. If I give you one that's designed for Major League Baseball, you want another one that's designed for Major League Baseball. If I give you one for Little League, you want another one for Little League. You want one exactly the same. And that's what alos means. The, the second part of that is parakletos. Parakletos is a legal term. It means he pleads another's cause before a judge. He's an advocate or an intercessor. So Jesus said, I'm going to give you another one exactly like me. The Holy Spirit is exactly like Christ. The only difference is Jesus was here in the flesh. The Spirit is here in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit does the same, has the same functions as Christ. He, he reveals Christ to us. He teaches us about Christ. And it says he's also an intercessor. In verse 17, the same chapter, John 14, it says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, for he dwelleth within you and shall be in you. So when we receive the Holy Spirit, he dwells in us. He dwells in us. He comes and doesn't just sit on our shoulder or sit on the top of our head. He comes and dwells within us. And a lot of people say, oh, i got Jesus in my heart. No, you've got the Holy Spirit in your heart. The Bible says that Jesus ascended back to the Father. He's seated at the right hand of God. The Holy Spirit came back to earth because Jesus prayed to the Father and the Father sent the Holy Spirit back. Another one exactly like him. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He dwells within us and is in us. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? In John 14, 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. In John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Notice in this verse, Jesus telling his disciples, it's expedient. It's better for you if I go away. And we all talk about, man, I'd love to be able to spend some time in the presence of Jesus. Well, the problem with that is, if Jesus was still here, can you imagine how long the line would be to get to, into his presence? I mean, we'd have to find out exactly where he is, and we'd have to fly to that place. And then we'd probably have to take a number. And he's on number 16, and my number is 6,828. And each person gets to spend however much time they want with him, because he's not going to give them two minutes and, okay, you're done, go. No, he's going to spend time with them. He wants us to come and spend time with him. So it's expedient that he goes away, because now God has sent the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is exactly like Jesus. He dwells within us. So if we want to spend time with Jesus, we spend time with the Holy Spirit. We can spend time with the Holy Spirit because He's here. We can get in the presence of the Holy Spirit because He's here. Verse 13 says, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak. And He will show you things to come. Verse 14, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. So there we see the Holy Spirit is going to reveal Christ. He's going to take the things of Christ and reveal them to us and teach them to us and show them to us. He's going to give us the information we need to have that relationship with Christ. But we've got to get to that level of relationship with the Holy Spirit. We've got to be where the Holy Spirit can trust us. And so when we look at who the Holy Spirit is, I'm, I know I'm moving fast, but I've got a lot to cover. When we look at the Holy Spirit, who he is, in John 14, 12, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
He that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he shall do also, and greater works shall he do, because I go to my Father. So Jesus had to go to the Father. The Holy Spirit had to come. He had to fill us with his presence. We get in that relationship where, Jesus, where the Holy Spirit trusts us, and now we begin to function in the same functions that Jesus did. It's the Holy Spirit functioning through us, just like Jesus functioned here on the earth. So when we look at who, who the Holy Spirit is and how he manifests himself through us, the Holy Spirit is manifesting the presence of Jesus in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit should begin to manifest himself through us, through love, through joy, through peace, through long-suffering, through gentleness, through goodness, through meekness, through temperance, through faith. Those are fruits that we should begin to bear. Fruit has to be cultivated. You don't just all of a sudden wake up one day and boom, you're producing fruit. You've never seen a peach tree, just boom, one day it's got peaches all over it. It just had buds on it yesterday, but now it's got full peaches. No. Fruit has to be cultivated. You have to grow in love. You have to grow in gentleness. You have to grow in goodness. You have to grow in meekness. You have to grow in temperance. These things have to manifest. They have to be cultivated in your life. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So we, if we're in the body of Christ, we're baptized into the body, the Holy Spirit is given to us, it's given to every man for the profit of all. So the Holy, Holy Spirit should manifest through us, through each one of us, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. The Holy, Holy Spirit should manifest those, those fruits through us. In verses 8 through 10, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, it lists the different, the, the gifts of the Spirit. The words of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, work of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. So the Holy Spirit should begin to manifest different fruits. He should begin to manifest different gifts. Now, do we all get all the same gift? No. God gives us different gifts. And, and Pastor Caleb talked about all the different gifts, the gifts of administration, all that. These are specific to the Holy Spirit. And verse, in Ephesians 5, 18, it says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And one of the things that sticks out to me in this verse is, wine, there's excess. You get drunk, you fall down, you pass out, you have problems. But you cannot get too much of the Holy Spirit. You need to get, we need to all get so filled with the Holy Spirit that we're filled, we're continuously being filled. And the Bible, that verse actually means be being filled continuously. It'd be like pulling a car up to the gas pump, riding down the road beside a tanker truck with the nozzle in your car, pumping gas as you're driving down the road. I mean, that's the way they do some of these jet planes, some of these military planes. They've got a, a, an airplane that's got full of fuel, and it flies down through the air, and a plane pulls up under it, and they fill the plane with fuel while it's flying. Imagine if we were to go down the road beside a tanker with the gas nozzle stuck in our gas tank. We could drive for weeks and never run out of gas. So be being filled. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit means that we, are received, we receive the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit begins to manifest his presence, begins to manifest his gifts in us and through us to glorify God. He reveals Christ to us. He reveals truth to us. He tells us things to come. He shows us. He brings all things to remembrance. So we shouldn't have to worry about, why can't I remember this? The Holy Spirit will bring, bring it to remembrance. So let's move on. Like I say, I'm trying to move quick tonight. The next one, I'm separating these two, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of fire for the purpose of teaching. A lot of people put them together because John came and he said, there's one coming after me that will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And many people put those two as one baptism. I'm separating them for the purpose of teaching. I want to teach the baptism of fire. In 1 Peter 4, 17, it says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So 
when we look at the baptism of fire, we have to understand God is using fire to purify us. He's using fire to cleanse us, to make us holy. In Luke 12, 49 through 50, it says, I'm come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? In other words, Jesus said, I'm coming to put a fire on the earth. And he said right there, he said, what if it's already stirred up? What if it's already been kindled? What if it's already smoking? What if we've already started building that fire? We've got the, the kindling on there. We've got the, the paper on there. We've already stuck the match to it. But the logs hadn't started burning yet. But the fire's already been stoked. It's, it's already going. Jesus said, I've come to send that fire on the earth. Why is he sending it? Because he wants his bride, the body of Christ, to be spotless, to be blameless. And in order for us to be that, we have to go through fire. Because he looks at us as a precious thing. Just like we look at gold and silver as precious things, God looks at us and says, you're precious. I've got to purify you with fire. I've got to get the impurities out of you. I've got to get those impurities to rise up so that we can get them out of you. In Ephesians 5.27, it says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, I'm on my personal testimony, I know when God starts putting me in the fire and God starts dealing with me on something, it's always something that I don't see in myself. I remember a time when God started dealing with me about pride, and I was like, Lord, I don't have any pride. If I've got pride, you're going to have to show it to me. <laughs> Wrong thing to say. <laughs> the next day I go to work, and the guy that's working with me said, Ron, man, you're an incredible carpenter, but you're so arrogant and full of pride, I can't hardly stand to work with you. I was like, okay. I go eat with my parents the next day, and my dad looks at me and says, Ron, I have never known you to be so arrogant, full of pride. <laughs> okay, guy. The next day, somebody else comes to me and says, well, when did you get to be so full of pride? And I was like, Lord, okay, you've shown me. He said, no. You told me you wanted me to show you, so I'm going to show you. That night, I go to bed and I go to sleep. And throughout that night, God's given me visions from my childhood up to that day of times I had been full of pride, things I had done to demonstrate pride. And God began to show me that, and I was like, Lord, forgive me. I repent of it. Forgive me that. And I asked God, I said, Lord, if I hadn't repented of that, what would have happened? And he said, pride, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. He said, I would have had to put you through some kind of destruction. I would have had to destroy you in some way to break you, to break that pride out of you. And just like with, with silver and gold, when you go through the furnace, what happens? The impurities rise to the top. Well, the things that are in us that we don't recognize, all of a sudden they begin to rise up to the top. We got a problem with profanity. We don't recognize it because we don't know we got a problem with it. God begins to deal with us and said, You need to repent of profanity. I'm putting you in the furnace. All of a sudden, it's blankety, 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 blank. Everywhere you go. Nothing but profanity coming out of your mouth. And you're like, Where did all this come from? It's because it's rising to the surface. God's exposing it to you so that you can repent of it. Because he wants to scrape it off. He wants to pull the dross off of it. He wants you to see this is an impurity that's in you. He wants it to be so blatant to you and expose it to you that you see it. And you're like, man, I can't stand this. Why am I cussing so much? Why am I using so much profanity? It's because God's put you in the fire in that area. And it's rising to the surface. And it affects. It, it agitates you. It frustrates you. It makes you angry. I, didn't, I don't remember me ever using this much profanity. Well, God's showing it to you because he's, he wants you to repent of it. When you repent of it, he can pull it off. But if you don't repent of it, you have to go through the fire. You have to go through judgment. So God uses fire for that. And it says, um, now this is, Something I want to I want to show. It says in, in Matthew, so make sure I've got my notes right. Matthew 13, 37 through 43. And that's the parable of the tares and the wheat. Now this is this one 
I learned something when I was studying this, which is always what I want to do when I'm studying. It says, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. So at the end of time, God's going to separate the wheat from the tares. He's going to pull the tares out and going to toss them in the fire. But then in verse 41, it says, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom. Now notice, he's already pulled the tares out and burned them. Now it says he's sending his angels into the kingdom, and he's pulling out, it says, They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. So when we get down to the last days and end of time, and God pulls out the tares from the wheat, he's coming for the church next. And we started off with the fact that judgment begins in the house of God. It begins in the house of God because God wants to purify us now so that he doesn't have to pull us out then. In Deuteronomy 4, 24, it says, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Now, I don't know that this is actual, but the fact that God is a consuming fire, just like with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went into the fire and they weren't touched. They'd been purified. The fire had already pulled off the dross. It already purified them. They were in good shape, and they weren't burned up. But what if we get to that place where we walk into heaven, and God is a consuming fire, and we walk into heaven and we get burned up right then? Because we've not been purified. I don't know if heaven's going to be 65 degrees with a nice gentle breeze looking out across the ocean. Or if it's going to be warm. God's a consuming fire. But I think about that. If I can't let God purify me now, then I can't stand in his presence. I've got to be pure. Let's see. Proverbs, well, let's see, Psalms 104.4, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire. So one of the things we see with fire, the ministers bring a message that should bring correction. It should bring things that cause you to, to think about things, to repent, to deal with things. And his angels are the, it says his angels are the wind. They're the ones that blow on that message that cause the fire to get hot. They're the ones that blow and get the fire to burn really, really hot, really fire, really fiery hot. So it purifies us. It causes us to, to repent. It causes us to, to turn to him. In Hebrews 12, 8, it says, But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you're bastards and not sons. The baptism of fire is a baptism of correction. If we don't allow God to purify us and deal with us here, then the Bible says that we're bastards. We're illegitimate sons. And it says in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom. They prophesied, they cast out demons, they did all these things. But it says, depart from me, you that work iniquity. They didn't go through the baptism of fire. They didn't get purified. They didn't let God deal with their sin and work it out of them so they'd be pure, so they'd be holy. The next one, that's the last of baptism. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about laying on of hands kind of quick. We've got about 10, 11 minutes. So I'm going to talk about it kind of quick. And then we're going to try to get one more, and that'll be it for tonight. And we'll be done. Laying on of hands. Laying on of hands is carried on from the Old Testament to the New. Just like we started with baptism. Baptism was not mentioned in the Old Testament. But laying on of hands is. They laid hands in the Old Testament to anoint people for, for leadership positions. They anointed kings. They anointed different people through the laying on of hands. Lay hands on someone to commission them and release them into a spiritual office or ministry. In Acts 13, 4 through 5, it says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Notice, it's not the laying on of hands that releases somebody and commissions them. It's the laying on of hands in obedience to God calling them and releasing them. We laid hands on to, to say, hey, I've heard what God said about you. We're going to lay hands on you to, to say, 
we're, we agree with God that you're being sent out. Mark 16, 18. Verse, verse 18 says, They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So we see that laying on of hands is one form of operating in healing. It's not always necessary for laying on of hands for healing. Jesus did healing many times where he just spoke a word, and somebody in another city somewhere got healed. So he didn't have to lay on hands. So laying on of hands is just a method that God uses to produce healing. It's what God told the believers to do, to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In 1 Timothy 5, it says, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep yourself pure. One of the things we have to understand here, laying on of hands is a transference of anointing. If a person is not willing to turn from their sin and we go and lay hands on them, we become a partaker with them of their sin. So it tells us not to lay hands on somebody hastily. Be careful to lay hands on somebody. We don't want to be a partaker of the same sins that they're involved in. In James 5, 14 and 15, it says, Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing with him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Well, anointing with oil, sometimes it's done just by pouring the oil on. Other times it's done by putting the oil on your hand and anointing, laying them on hands. So that's another example of laying on hands for the sick. So I'm going to stop with that one, and I want to discuss one more thing. I'm going to, I'm going to miss one in Hebrews 6, and that is the um, resurrection of the dead. But I want to talk about eternal judgment. This is not a teaching of mine. I'm saying that up front. It's one of the best teachings I've ever heard on this eternal judgment. And I've got about seven minutes to finish, but I think I've got time. We all know what a timeline is. And let's say we take a timeline that's two feet long. And that two foot long timeline represents the life of a human being. So we'll say that the life of a human being is 80 years. So at one foot, that's 40 years. At six inches, that's 20 years. So every inch and a half is five year increments. So we could take that two foot timeline and break it down and say, okay, during this five years, I accomplished this. I did this. I, I did I, I, this, time, this five years I got married, this five years I bought a house, this, this five years I graduated college, this five years, all these accomplishments, we could break them down into inch and a half increments, which is a five-year increment. And imagine that those first, that first foot, the decisions we make, the choices we make, the things we do, determines how we live the next foot, the next 40 years of our life. Because many people, they buy their house, their first house when they're young, and they most people live usually in that same house. They might sell it and move to another one. But most people don't move every five years. They buy a house, they stay in it, and they stay in it for a long period of time. And so when we look at that first foot, the first 40 years, we buy a house, we move into a neighborhood, we get neighbors, we buy a car, we've done all these things. And let's say that that first foot, everything that we do in that first foot determines how we live in that second foot. So now... My first 40 years of my life determines how I'm living my second 40 years of my life. So the choices I've made, the decisions I've made, the life I've lived and everything is affecting the second half of my life. Well, that's all well and good when we look at it in that perspective. We can break it down into inch and a half increments and five-year increments. Well, let's say, okay, let's say that those first two feet represent everything we do in life. And now we stretch that timeline out to three feet. Well, that's still no big deal. The big picture looks at it, oh, I've, I've done all these things in the first 40 years of my life, or the first 80 years of my life, the first two feet, that's going to affect the next foot, which is eternity. Well, that's no big deal. That's only 40 years. But then we look at eternity and we put it into perspective, and no, it's not a foot. We stretch it out to 10 feet. So now we're looking at 400 years. And so those first two feet represents the 80 years of my life, that I've made choices, I've made decisions, and these choices and these decisions and all these things that I've done determine how I live the next 320 years. Now that changes it drastically. It becomes more important about the decisions that we've made, 
the choices that we've made that first, 40, that first 80 years. Because now 320 years, we've got a lot of living to do based on how we live those first 80 years. But then, that's not eternity. We take that 10 feet, we stretch it out to 100 feet. Now we're talking about 4,000 years. So the choices that we make those first 80 years of our life really become important now. I mean, when we make this choice in the first 80 years of our life, now we're talking about 3,920 years. That's a long time based on these first 80 years of how we made, how we live, the choices that we've made. But we're still not at eternity. Eternity, we take that 100 feet, now we stretch it out to a mile. I'm not doing the math. I'm not going to do the math. But let me tell you what, that's a lot of time. And when, it, when we look at it from that big picture, if you were to get up in a plane and you could look down and see that timeline, this first two feet would be just a little blob and it would look like a starting point. It would be a zero time. The choices that we make, the life we live, the things we do in that first little blob, that first zero time, determines how we live for the next mile of, of time. So those choices that we make have really become important now. The decisions that we've made have really become important because that's a long time. And so when we look at eternal judgment, we have to realize how important it is today. The choices that I make today, while I'm on this side of the ground, the choices that I make determine how I'm going to live through eternity. And eternity doesn't stop at a mile. It goes on. It keeps going. And so these decisions, these choices that I'm making right here become critically important. These choices right now determine how I'm going to live on the other side forever and ever. The choices that I make. I mean, if I make the choices now to say, no, God, you're not real. I reject your son. To live that time in fire and you feel the fire burning you, but you can't get out of it, that becomes very important, the choices that we make right now. These choices, eternal judgment is eternal. It's just that. It's not the extra foot that we added on at the start. It's not just for another 40 years. It's not the next 320 years. It goes on and on and on. So the choices that we make right now become very critically important. So as we've talked about last week and this week, we've, we've laid foundation. This, found, this foundation, if you get proper foundation, it will keep you centered. It will keep you focused. It should help you to grow and be consistent in your growth for Christ. It should help you to stay focused. Those of y'all that were here last week, you remember I talked about if you were to take off in a plane from Washington State and go to Florida, and that pilot's gauges all went out. And he said, oh, we're good. I know how long it's going to take us to get there. And I can hold this plane steady. No. He doesn't know if it goes into a headwind or it goes into a tailwind. He doesn't know if the change in the, in the air has caused him to slow down or speed up. He doesn't know if he's gotten off just a little bit. When he goes to land, you might be out in the Atlantic. You might be in the Gulf. You might be somewhere up the East Coast. You don't know where because you don't have proper foundation. The Bible says this is foundation. Let's establish foundation. Let's build on our foundation. We talked about last week, if we build on the foundation with gold, silver, precious jewels, when they go into the fire, they won't be burned. But if we build on the foundation with hay, straw, and stubble, when it goes into the fire, it's going to be burned up. We've got a foundation. We've been taught foundation these past two weeks. Let's build on that foundation. Let's continue to grow on that. 